Um, we have Laura Cortez here from La Una Local 183. Um, my name is Brandon Hay. I'm the program manager um, for Toronto Community Benefits Network. Um, and this is Career Talks in Construction and Trades. Um, today's agenda, um, I, I just recall that, you know, I have to remind myself to sort of slow down um, and also just to breathe. Um, so we're going to ask folks to, you know, to write your name in the chat if you haven't done so, identify yourself on the screen. We're going to do some land acknowledgement, um, talk a little bit briefly about the purpose of the career talks um, that takes place twice a month, um, a little bit of housekeeping, and how you can get involved further with TCBN. Um, and then we're going to jump into conversation with Laura from 1A3. And then we're going to take your questions. So for questions, because this is a webinar, um, definitely ask you to write your, your questions in the chat. And then when we, when we get to the question period, um, I'm going to ask you if you want to come over and ask your question directly. Um, so if you can, just make sure you... Um, if you can put your your um, yourself on mute, if you're not speaking right now, just to cut down on any background noises. Um, and then how you can stay connected for upcoming sessions. Okay. Um, So as I said before, if you can write your name, your gender pronoun, your geographic location, or the organization um, or school um, that you are with, or if you're a pre-apprenticeship program, such as Building Up or Quick Start, um, just write that you're with that organization. And then I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna do a land acknowledgement. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. This recognition of the contributions and historic importance of indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. We're all treaty people, Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. I'd like to also acknowledge those of us who came here involuntarily as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. And so I honor and pay tribute to the ancestors of African origin and descent. The Korea talks and construction um, the Career Talks in, in Construction and Trades Conversation Series will give each of you an opportunity to engage with various experts from various unions, constructions, and construction and trade sector. Uh, the goal from these conversations is that you will hear firsthand what it takes to get into that specific trade. And this is also a great opportunity to network, also to decrease any isolation that you might be navigating due to COVID-19 and physical distancing. So a couple of housekeeping, uh, feel free to use the chat function to write your questions down. These conversations will be recorded and archived. Um, I wanna ask if, um, so I'm, I have a Josh, Josh. <laughs> uh, Brandon, it's Joshua. Yeah, can you go on mute if possible? Oh, I'm sorry, all right. Thanks. Um, these conversations will be recorded and archived on TCBN website and on social media as such as YouTube for, for public viewing. Um, and we'll be answering questions at the end of the panel discussion. Um, how you can get involved with uh, Toronto Community Benefits uh, Program Department is a, a few ways. Um, we have our Next Gen Builders Mentorship Program um, and these are for folks who are in a union and we connect you with a mentor um, along that process of, of your apprenticeship. Um, and then we have our Quick Start in Construction program which is a pre-apprenticeship program 
And this is the first step. So this is where you would go, um, go into our program, uh, the Quick Start program. Um, and then when you graduate, you just heard Josh. Josh is a colleague of mine. He's a, he, he works with folks to get them employment within the unions. So once you graduate from our program, we would connect you with Josh. Um, he would find you work and then we connect you um, with Sarah in our Next Gen Builders Mentorship Program. And this is to support you um, from, the, your, your, from the first year of your apprenticeship up until you, you reach journey person status. Uh, launching this year, I'm super excited to talk about our, uh, our newcomer pathway into construction program. And this is for specifically newcomers and refugees who are interested in construction, uh, specifically in the skilled trades or the PAT, so professional, administrative, and tech jobs. Um, and then we also are launching our, our apprenticeship readiness curriculum um, that has been in the works for two years. If you have any questions on any of these programs, you can contact me um, at bhay at communitybenefits.ca. All right, so we have our guest speaker this, this, this afternoon. We have um, Laura. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I'm going to sh share a quick video. You can see my screen, yes? 
Yes, I can. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, Laura uh, Cortez, I'm just moving this here so I can fully see it. Laura Cortez is the Outreach and Social Media Coordinator for La Una Local 183 Training Center. She went to the University of Guelph Humber in Toronto and graduated with a bachelor's degree in finance and a diploma in business management. She, came, she comes from a family of trade, trades workers, which is where she gets her knowledge and appreciation for the trades. As the outreach and social media coordinator for La Una Local 183 Training Center, she oversees handling all calls from schools, employment center, and partner groups regarding all tours of, our, of their training campuses and has created a social media presence for La Una Local 183 Training Center. She devotes herself to developing partnerships with um, different organizations in the community. She coordinates with OYAP contracts and high school guidance counselor, counselors to arrange visits and attend career fairs. She sits on the Aboriginal Apprenticeship Board of Ontario, which also has their um, conference going on tomorrow that they're doing great work, um, assists with outreaching to various Indigenous organizations in the greater Toronto area. She assists with the development and purchasing of promotional and marketing materials and maintains and updates the training center, the center's website and social media accounts. Laura's goal is to promote the construction trades as a lucrative and rewarding career. Welcome, Laura, how are you doing, ma'am? I'm good, thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. Absolute pleasure. Like, it's a mouthful you're, you're, what you're doing. Like, like I it, know. <laughs> It's, it's honestly, it's not me. It's definitely like the organization that I work for. They're so amazing. And they really just like to get into everything and make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity for, um, you know, and to make sure that the trades and the programs that we offer are accessible to as many people as possible. So that's, that's a really big thing. And which is why we're focusing so much, not just on our membership, but also on everyone else. So and also that video, I did just want to preface it by Please. saying that it was before COVID. So I know a lot of you may have been like, why are they not wearing any masks? So that those pictures were taken before COVID. It looks so great, but unfortunately our pictures now look a lot different. But so that video was uh, pre-COVID. All right, and we'll, we'll jump into that actually. Yeah. Um, how did you get into your role and how long have you worked in your current role? So I've been with the training center now for it's I'm going on six years in July. Um, I actually started I was working for a company that provided benefits for the training center. And I, you know, I found out that so we were I was working for the third party provider, which is why I know that, you know, uh, our members have extremely great benefits because I used to be I used to help with that as well. Um, so I actually heard about the position for the outreach coordinator at the training center and I was super interested and like I said in my bio, I come from a family of trades workers. Um, my dad, my grandfather, they've all been in the trades forever and they just, I saw how much of a great living they were able to provide for me and my siblings. So I just figured what a better way to kind of honor that in the sense to really just promote the trades. And I feel like I was really inclined at First, also because I am a woman, so there is a bit of a stigma with that whenever it comes to women in the trades and all that kind of stuff. And whenever I present to a group, usually a majority, a group of males in a class, a lot of them kind of just look at me and say, hmm, what do you know about trades? So it's definitely, um, it, it made it very interesting for me. That was a bit of a learning curve, but uh, I just, I was so passionate about uh, the trades and just being able to promote them that I just figured it was a perfect fit for me. No, you, you you shared a story a few times that we've met, like in, where you talked to classes um, yeah. about your brother working in construction. Um, what were some of the the lessons you learned from him? And and you know, you mentioned your family that made you interested in working in the construction yourself. Yeah. So um, whenever I obviously I started looking for my career path, there was definitely a. My parents are always like, "Oh, you should really get into you know, go to university, get your degree, whatever the case was." Um, and again, my, my father, he's very like old fashioned when it comes to that. So he's like, you should definitely go to university. Go, that's what he wanted for his kids forever. So whenever I, I took the route, I'm like, I'm going to go to university. I was working two jobs to put myself through university. It was, it was definitely very difficult for me. Um, and at the end of it, trying to find a job was very hard. So 
little by little, I kind of moved my way up into kind of the position that I wanted to. And then I saw my brother who right after high school was like, I'm not doing university. I can't sit in the classroom and listen to someone talk all day. Um, it just wasn't his fit. And I looked at him and I was like, whoa, that's super risky. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, I guess. So in my head, I'm like, well, what are you going to do? Because again, whenever I was in high school, the trades were not promoted the way they are now. It was kind of like university, college, if all else fails, trades. So I, I always tell them, like, you were very brave in taking that step. We're only a year apart. So we had basically the same experience in high school. And he kind of just said, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to take an apprenticeship and I'm going to go to work. So he took an apprenticeship. He had no school debt by the age, by the time he was 21, he was making full rate. Um, he's now 28 and he's making a very good living for himself. He has no debt, has a house, has a car, has a family. He's just completely set. So thankfully, because I lived at home, I, I also didn't have any school debt, but there's a lot of people that they, like school debt is a huge thing, especially whenever it comes to buying your own home and you kind of have that looming over you. And he loves his job. He goes every single day and he's like, this is something that I just absolutely love doing. We'll drive by a building and he'll be like, oh, I helped build that. Or I put that building up. The buildings in Mississauga, he was a part of that from the ground up. So it's really exciting to kind of see just the passion that comes with the trade that he went into. And don't get me wrong, I really love my job. But again, what I took in university is definitely not what I'm doing now. I'm not in finance and I'm not in business management. So it was definitely very hard finding a job with that. And it just goes to show that there's two avenues that you can get into and they're, they both are lucrative, but I just always feel the trades to be the fastest way into a rewarding and a lucrative career. So there isn't that kind of wait time. Whereas with, I feel with university, there's always that kind of lull to see, oh, did I get a job? And now sometimes even having a bachelor's degree means is just as much as having a high school degree. Unless you specify, it's very difficult to get a job in that sector that you want to get into. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's jump right into it, man. So yeah. what are the Red Seal programs that like, you know, local 183 uh, training offers? And can you talk a little bit about each one of them? Yeah. So the first one that we have is the Brick and Stone Mason. That one is definitely one of our oldest apprenticeships, and it's one of the oldest trades actually historically. So brick and stone masons have been around for centuries. So it's definitely something, um, it is a quite a beautiful art form. It's, it is a dying trade. Um, I do believe that whenever the word prefabricated walls came out, everyone kind of just freaked out and was like, there's going to be no more need for bricklayers. They're going to make everything in factories, blah, blah, blah. And that obviously was not the case because prefabricated walls will never look as beautiful as a brick and stone wall. So um, right now there is a huge demand for a brick and stone apprenticeship. It is three levels long. So um, the, way, the way the apprenticeships would work is a work to learn program. So you're basically in school for a period of time and then you would go out and get your hours and then you would come back until you finish your levels and then you write your red seal. So that's the brick and stone program. Um, our second apprenticeship is the cement finisher. So that one is a little bit shorter. It's only two levels and it's like, I believe it's, it's 4,800 hours. So it's a lot shorter and brick and stone is 5,600 hours. Um, the brick and the cement finishing sector in our union is quite large. So we are the residential and the heavy civil sector union. So we do all the condo buildings that you see, all the, um, residential units, roads, bridges, all that kind of stuff. There is some sort of cement finishing that's part of that. So that apprenticeship is, and it's also the newest apprenticeship because it actually just became Red Seal certified in April, 2015. So it is quite new in the, in the Red Seal form. It was always there, just was never a Red Seal trade. So, um, and again, cement finishing, so formwork, low rise forming, all that kind of stuff deals with cement finishing. And then our most popular and our flagship program, which means it's the program that all of our locals um, teach just in different forms. Some may do commercial and then we do residential is the construction craft worker. So it used to be known as the general labor program. And now the construction craft worker basically caters to all the different sectors in our union. So there's 27 different sectors and you learn a little bit about everything. So some form work, some scaffolding, um, 
woodworking, cement finishing. So a little bit of everything depending on um, what level you're in. And the great thing about this apprenticeship is that you can actually get into any of the sectors. If you're a person that's unsure, if you say, I wanna get into um, an apprenticeship or I wanna get into construction, I'm just not sure what sector and you don't wanna be locked down to a certain sector, this would be the perfect one to get into. When you say locked down to a sector, what do you mean by that? So for example, if you become an electrician, you will forever be doing something with elect electrical work. And that's great. We need electricians out there. But there may be a type of person that says, you know what, I'm tired of doing electrical work. I want something else. I want to, you know, I'm just, I don't feel passionate about that. And the great thing with our union, if let's say you get into the tile setter sector or the high rise framing, and you say, you know what, I really don't want to do that anymore. You could say, oh, I really like sewer and water main. And then you can shift into that sector or you can shift into road work or house building. So if there's different areas you can get into and you're forever learning, which makes you very, um, it gives you that competitive advantage. You're the type of person on the site that says, well, John Doe over here knows how to do everything. So why don't we just move him around the company? And um, it, that competitive advantage helps you from getting laid off in the winter months as well. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, a lot, I think La Una 183 is one of the hidden gems out there that a lot of people don't know about. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, someone may see a La Una, someone at, at the grocery store or, you know, pumping gas or whatever and see someone walking around with a La Una jacket. But there's a five, La Una 506 and then there's La Una 183. Can you talk about what the difference, does, the difference or what does La Una 183 work specifically in? Yeah, so uh, 506, we are... They, we consider them our sister local. They deal with all the industrial, commercial, and institutional sides of construction. So all your school building, hospitals, shopping malls, all that kind of stuff, all the massive projects would be done by 506. We are residential and heavy civil. So all your condo buildings, your bridges, your roads, your light posts, your residential area, so your residential homes, that is all done by Local 183. So, which is why we are so large because the residential and heavy civil sectors is massive and it is forever working. Even during COVID, we have been just so busy because people need roads to drive on. We need condo buildings for people to move into, houses, bridges need to be built. So. And the infrastructure is really done. Uh, the majority of the infrastructure in Ontario is done by, or the greater GTA area is done by us. So that's definitely something that, which is why it keeps us so busy and which is why our membership is so large now. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a ballpark? Because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of folks listening right now that are liking what you're saying, but it comes down to the, the you know, the money, right? So yeah. can you give us... Um, Give us a ballpark of what someone in their first year as an apprentice um, and what they can make as a journey person in the following. So CCW, um, Brick and Stone, and Cement Finisher. So for CCW, usually the start is around $21 an hour. Now, because I, like I mentioned before, we have many different sectors and each sector has their own collective agreement. I'm not really sure what the end kind of pay would be only because it, it really all depends. A person that's working in the heavy civil sector is going to be making more than the person that is um, basically working in a house, in a, the house framing sector. So the pay is a little bit different, but usually the benchmark is around $21 an hour for cement, uh, sorry, for CCW. For Brick and Stone Mason, um, this one is a little, a lot lower. Uh, so it is about $16 an hour to start. But again, in my um, experience and what I've seen on the job sites, usually they do they are not paying that. They're paying a bit more than the $16 an hour. It's unfortunate. We really try to kind of go back and forth with uh, the people in the industry and kind of just say, you know, $16 an hour is not very appealing to a person that wants to get into an apprenticeship. But a lot, a lot of our union companies are not paying that. That's kind of just like I've mentioned, the benchmark. And it, it really just goes up from there. And every single time that you complete a level or you finish a certain amount of hours, you get pushed up into the next pay grade. So you're constantly getting kind of like moved up. And then sometimes even if you move into a different sector, you'll get paid more. So it's, it's really only up from there. That's what I always tell students. When you start off as an apprentice, it's really just up from there. 
Um, and for cement finisher, I believe it starts at $23 an hour. And it's the same. Again, if you're a cement finisher working for a bridge company, you'll probably be making more than a person working for a high rise forming company. So can you, I guess an advice, can you talk about the importance of, let's say I got into, you know, like, you know, one, one, eight, three, mm -hmm. can you talk about the, the importance of me taking courses? Cause the courses are free once I'm a, I'm a member to sort of get my certifications to become more attractive um, on the, for, for a potential job, basically. Yeah, for sure. So with our apprenticeship training, whenever a student is part of an apprenticeship program, I usually recommend for them to finish completely their apprenticeship program. So by a completed person, a completed uh, program would mean you have all your levels, which for example, let, let's take construction craft worker, for example, you have level one and two in construction craft worker. And then you would have all your hours. So you have your 2,400 hours completed and you have also written your red seal and passed. That is a completed journey person. So once you finish that, if you decide you're working a year into, you know, you're working a year in your um, apprenticeship and you decide I'm kind of tired of, let's say you got into uh, residential, residential buildings. So condos and you're like, I'm just so tired. I don't like heights. I I get colds, I don't like the winter, I don't, whatever the case may be, whatever it is, or it's too far, whatever the, the issue may be, then you can say, you know what, I, I, my friend told me that house framing is actually, you know, it's really great, it's more fast paced, you're moving to different job sites, you're not at the same building every single day, let me look into that. So we actually have the type, these programs called construction skills programs. And what they are, they are upgrade programs. So they are for students that want to, um, you know, fine tune their skills and they're very sector specific. So we have, for example, house framing, tile setter, um, road construction, asphalt. So all, a bunch of different programs catered specifically to the industry, to the sectors that we represent. Now, it, you could take a house framing program for eight weeks and then say, you know what, I have this certification now. And then the union will aid with your placement into that sector. So you've just added another certification on top of your apprenticeship. So these are ways to fine tune your skills. And for example, a lot of people will get laid off in the winter months instead of sitting at home doing nothing for yourself and just, you know, kind of wasting your time. You can come back for an eight week program. The bulk of our training is actually done in the winter. And we do that so we can cater to people that are laid off. So um, those are very great ways of trying to, you know, first of all, take advantage of, of um, the fact of your membership dues because your membership dues pay for your programs and to really just constantly upgrade yourself because you never really know where the boom in construction is going to be. So it's all we, you know, there, there's never such thing as knowing too much. So that's also something that we're constantly trying to promote our, our programs. That's really helpful. Um, can you talk about the health and safety courses that La Una One Eight Three delivers? Yes. Yeah, so we actually started our training center. Uh, initially started with uh, promoting health. Uh, sorry, giving health and safety courses to our membership. So these are the oldest programs that we've had. And health and safety for us, we usually don't even have to promote it because we're that busy. So we offer, for example, the mandatory skills. So working at heights, women's OSA first aid, all those mandatory skills, we offer them. And mo the uh, a lot of those skills are actually in your apprenticeship program. So if you're coming in as an apprentice, you don't have to worry about taking any of the health and safety on your own time. We make sure we give you a complete package and you just show up. Um, so, and we do, we, then we also offer sector specific courses, for example, sewer and water main safety, uh, tunnel safety, utility safety. So they're more sector specific. And usually those will be mandated by companies. So if you're, let's say with Intera, they deal with the utilities in the GTA and they say, great, Mike, I'm really happy to have you here, but we actually want you to take a utility uh, safety program with 183. Usually the company will send you for that. So, or they'll let you know you need to take this course. It's mandatory on our site. And that's kind of how we um, have our health and safety. So, and health and safety is booked on a daily basis. So if you ever, you know, need any type of health and safety, you could just give us a call and then we'll fit you into um, when we're offering it. So what happens if someone says, listen, I just came from a, a pre-apprenticeship program, like building up or trade links. I, I got a, I did my, you know, my health and safety there. 
um, do I still have to take it with you guys? Yeah, so we do, um, we don't, the only reason why we don't accept other places health and safety is only because we audit our own health and safety program. And we make sure if for whatever reason, for example, if let's say building up, they teach working at heights, we can't put building ups working at heights on our training cards because those programs have not been audited by us. They're not by our instructors. We teach, and I'm not and again, building up is great. I'm not saying, for example, their program is different than ours. It's just we are accountable for what we uh, teach. So we're able to kind of audit like this is a standard that we're teaching at and this is how we teach our students. It's the only reason. It's just like I'm sure building up wouldn't say, oh, we're going to put 183s on their training cards. We each have our own. So um, you would have to retake it again. So if you're a student that's thinking about getting into an apprenticeship, I would hold off on taking health and safety because we will teach you that. Okay, thank you for that. And then, so let's talk about COVID. Uh, so during COVID, can you talk a little bit about uh, the health and safety precautions that La Una 183 is taking to keep keep their members safe? For sure. So obviously COVID has really impacted the world. Um, this has been a huge learning curve for everyone, especially for us, because a lot of our work is very hands-on. It's in person. It's, you know, we're kind of all just there doing what we need to do. So it is quite a difficult uh, situation, but again, we have really tried to move forward with that and try to, because we haven't stopped being busy. I also feel like a lot of people realize that um, when the world was shutting down, construction never stopped. We have not stopped, we have not closed down, we have just been completely going at it. And we've also made ways to kind of help our students to continue with their processes. So when COVID first started, we actually initiated our virtual training. So similar to this, it would be like, you know, we'd have participants online, we would have an instructor, we would have a PowerPoint, and then we would go through all of our health and safety courses through that. At the moment, because um, we are now able to kind of teach our apprenticeship training, we have just catered to health and safety because those are mandatory things that our workers need in order to get onto the job site and also in apprenticeship training. So at the moment, we're not offering construction skills only because we're really just trying to focus on the two things that we know will get you onto a job site, which is health and safety and also our apprenticeship training. So uh, we basically have split up our campus. Our health and, All of our health and safety is at one part of our campus. And then we've also moved out all of our um, apprenticeships into the training phase. We make sure that we have regular um, COVID screening. So whenever students come in, we have temperature checks. They have a checklist that they have to fill out just to make sure, you know, um, everything is kosher in that sense. Um, if there are class sizes have been reduced significantly, uh, usually we have about 12 people in a class for an apprenticeship. And now we have between four and six. So it is a lot um, smaller and the reason is because we just we don't thankfully we haven't had a COVID case at any of our campuses and we want to keep it that way because if we have one case we have to completely shut down the whole operation which you know will cause a lot of people to fall behind in their apprenticeship training which is what we don't want so um we have hand sanitizing stations we have regular kind of like stop wash your hands reset and everyday cleaning just to make sure that the campus has been safe and knock on wood everything's been good. We haven't had any issues so far. And again, that's really to thank on our executive director. He's been very, very proactive in everything that he has done. He's just been at the forefront of everything, which is, you know, it, it shows that in our campus, which is why we've been so safe. And even in the sense, you know, virtual training, online training, and we've really just made everything um, accessible. So people don't have any excuse to say, oh, well, I can't get training right now. So and again, we get questions. We get about two to three people asking me a day, are you guys open? Are you guys open? And I'm like, we are 100% open and we are 100% safe. So again, we want people to feel comfortable coming to our campus, making sure that there isn't a an issue whenever they come. So so currently you guys are not are, are doing in-class sessions, not virtual classes, yes? Uh, yeah, so right now we were doing virtual before, but uh, but now that I think it, we believe it was in June that the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities said we're able to go back to in-person training. Again, we're wearing masks the whole day, um, sanitization, social distancing, all that kind of stuff is put in place. And when it was virtual, did was there a, 
did students have to keep their screens on? Or because I know one of the things in some of the pre-apprenticeship programs, yeah. some of folks, yeah, some of the participants don't want to have the screens on. Yeah. How did that come up and how do you guys handle that? Yeah, so there, you know, we, we kind of just leave it to the discretion of the student. At the end, there at the end of all of the classes, there is an exam, like a test. So it is done online and they're able to kind of like click through it. So Again, if, you, if you're not paying attention to what the teacher is telling you and you're kind of just falling asleep on the other end, then that it'll show in your test results. Um, a lot of the a lot of the students did have their screens on. They had no issues with it. But again, we we're not forcing anyone to. It's really up to their discretion. So but it's just if we call on you, we want to make sure that we're not going to say, you know, hello, are you there? Are you awake? Whatever the case is. So it is very interactive and the, and the instructors have been so great in there. They make sure that they're able to keep the interaction. So it's not just a person talking and everyone else is kind of falling asleep in the background. No, thank you for that. So you, you answered that question around what are the class sizes now? You said around four to six. Yes. Um, how many different training campuses does La Una 183 have? And is there different courses offered at each one? Yeah, so we have um, five, uh, six actually. So our Vaughn Training Center, which is our largest campus, and it's where the majority of our health and safety, construction skills, and apprenticeships are taught. Then we have our Barry campus. So we also teach, a, we teach basically all the same things. It's just most of the courses are not offered in Barry just because there isn't as much in demand as there is in the GTA. Then we have out east, we have one in Kingston and Coburg. Our Toronto office, which is our head office, um, we usually just do health and safety training there. We're not equipped to do like um, any of our construction skills or apprenticeships. And our newest campus is actually in Cambridge. So we are now, I believe we're offering health and safety there. So that's still our brand new campus. Um, and we're hoping, unfortunately, you know, the opening was whenever COVID kind of started. So hopefully um, in the coming year, we'll be able to offer apprenticeships and construction skills there for anyone out in, in the West area. Okay. Um, this is where I'm gonna ask you to put on your advice hat. Mm -hmm. um, over the six years that you've been with Layuna, um, what can you, when you think about apprentices that have been successful in the, your training programs, what are three things that these individuals do well? So definitely, and I know this kind of may come as a shock for a lot of people, but um, skill is definitely not one of them. You don't have to be, you don't have to have the best skills in order to succeed because we have had students that are very skilled and they have a poor attitude. They're not punctual and they think they know it all and they make it nowhere. So um, I just want to put that out there just to kind of like, so people understand that a lot of people get overwhelmed and they say, I don't even know how to hold a hammer. That's great, that's why we're here. We're here to teach you from the ground up. So a person that's coachable is definitely number one. Um, we want a person that is able to, you know, comes in, is able to take constructive criticism. We're able to kind of um, mentor them and coach them into a, a good student and to, and then the skill will come after that. Punctuality is a huge, a huge, huge, like I can't even, I'm gonna say punctuality, punctuality, punctuality three times so everyone understands. Punctuality. And the reason being is because on a job site, I'll give you an example. The concrete truck is there at 6 a.m. If Mary is not there when the concrete truck comes, bye Mary, we're going to pull Leslie and pull her in and she'll be the one doing the job because the concrete truck waits for no one. So I always say that that is the most basic example, but that's just how the industry works. And we make sure that whenever our students come to our campus, we drill that into we drill that into them and we say if you aren't if you miss if you are late or you miss three classes you're kicked out of the program no ifs ands or buts now obviously if there's extenuating circumstances you're sick we don't want you to come to the campus sick whatever the case is but if it's just because i've gotten the craziest excuses i remember one time this one gentleman said well i thought that monday was sunday so i didn't come I was like, get yourself a calendar. We all have it on our phones. Get yourself a calendar. There is no excuse. So I, we've honestly heard them all. Lisa Price, who's our manager of apprenticeship and skills, she has, she can write a book on the excuses. So punctuality is definitely one of our biggest things. And 
there's been cases where a student will come up and say, why did I get kicked out of the program? I never missed a day. I'm like, yeah, but you were late three days, which means we count those as missed days because on the job site, you get one chance here. We're giving you two extra chances. So we're being nice because on the job site, if you don't show up, you're gone. There's a lineup around the block of people that want to get in. And that's the biggest thing. We've talked to our industry partners and they always say the same thing. A person that's coachable, has a good attitude and is punctual. So if you have these three things, the skill will come after we teach you the skill. So don't even worry about that part. As long as those are the three things, that's perfect. And on the flip side, um, when you think about, you talk about punctuality, mm -hmm. but you know, when you think about apprentices um, who are not successful in the training programs, what are three things that they fail to do? Yeah, so one of them would be you know, not, not having a good attitude. I know a lot of people, sometimes there's been times where a company will kind of volunteer students to come in and take a program and they, in their head, they're like, I've been in the industry for how long? Like, why do I need to take an apprenticeship program? Blah, blah, blah. They come in with this chip on their shoulder. And then when an instructor comes and says, oh yeah, what you did there is great, but maybe you should try doing it like this. And then they kind of just look at you like, do you know who I am? I've been in the industry. So that bad attitude is really going to get you nowhere. Um, you have to understand that people come to the training center to be, to make mistakes. You know, it's like you make them, that's where you want you to make your mistakes. So whenever you go onto an actual building, you're not making them there. Cause I'm sure none of us would want to move into a building that's, you know, if the floors start to be an inch off from the bottom, that means when you get to the 50th floor, you're going to be way off. And that's going to be a problem, especially when you're talking about tall skyscrapers. So uh, it's definitely, this is a place where we want students to make mistakes. And um, if you're the type of person that you come in with this bad attitude and saying, no, I, I'm perfect. I don't need to be here to learn. That'll be a problem. Tardiness, which is again, the flip side to the punctuality uh, that I said before. And also just to be able to have, I guess, more of like I, I, the mental agility in the sense. And what I mean by that is a lot of people will come in and we get students that say, oh, we're working outside, but it's cold. Or it's, you know, it's raining today, or it's not perfectly sunny. So I always tell students that you guys have to be mentally prepared for the construction industry, because it, it is a change. You are working out there. And these, these cold days, our members have not stopped working. So you, they are working in extreme temperatures. That's something that we do have to kind of, we, we mentally prepare. And again, a lot of our training is done indoors. Thankfully, we have a massive building that we're able to teach. But there is the, the, the instances where, where our executive director will say, okay, you know, I want the CCW classes working outside today. So it, it is a little bit colder, but they have to start to get used to this because on the job site, you got to know to come prepared, make sure you have like your proper PPE, your jacket, your whatever the case is. So um, it, it is going to be like that. And I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The construction industry is not easy. It's not for everyone. But if you know that you have that drive and that passion for it, then you will become successful in that. Awesome. Um, what are the requirements to apply for your training programs? Yeah, so for our apprenticeship programs, you have to be 18 years of age, have a you know, a minimum of grade 10 education. But again, I, for the students that are finishing high school, I'm not saying drop out at grade 10, finish your high school education. This is more for newcomers that have to um, transcribe their credits from a different country, whatever the case may be. So grade 10 is a minimum, but if you're a student that you're able to get your high school diploma, it'll help you in the end. And if we see a student that comes in with grade 10 and a student that comes in with their full diploma, we're gonna pick the person with a full diploma. Uh, you have to have access to a vehicle and um, also your full driver's license. And just to expand a little bit about that, the reason being is because whenever you finish your program, if you're successful in the program, we then relay those names to our union representatives and then they will help with placing you. If our union, represent, our union representative contacts you and say, hi, hello, um, the training center just said you finished your construction craft worker course. We actually have a, a job for you in Milton. And you say, oh, well, I, I can't get there because I don't have a car or driver's license. And now you're sitting at home and you don't have a, you don't have a job because of something that's hindering you, which could have been uh, dealt with before you kind of came in. So we really try to 
kind of weed out those type of applicants that are not accessible because it'll hinder you in the end. And we don't want to have students just sitting at home and not working, right? We want to make sure everyone goes to work. Um, and then, yeah, and that would basically be about it for the apprenticeships. The construction skills, you just have to be 18 years of age, access to a vehicle, and also um, your full driver's license. And then for the health and safety, there's no requirements for that one. Okay, cool. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the virtual tours that your union offers? Yeah, so we're actually just um, in the stages of now completing our virtual tour. We did all the filming for it. And, you know, to think about something positive that came out of COVID, this is something definitely positive that's coming out. Um, now, once the virtual tour video is done, which I'm hoping will be soon, the students will be able to basically almost like a go into our campus and look at it like from a 360 view, look up at the ceiling, look down, you can, it'll really be like a virtual experience to kind of go into our campus. Um, and this is a great way, especially for, I get a lot of phone calls, unfortunately, because we are quite busy. We don't do personal one-on-one -on -one tours. So we usually do it with whether it's a school board or our different partners, whatever the case is. Um, so this will be a great uh, tool for students, you know, if they just kind of want to say, well, I want to see what the campus looks like, like, what am I going into? It will just be like a click away and then you can kind of be fully immersed into our campus. And it would be the virtual tour of our Vaughn campus. So that is our largest campus. So it'll be a great way to kind of do that. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, what is local 183 training doing to engage more women in the construction sector? For sure. So again, like I mentioned at the beginning of just a little bit after my bio, I'm very uh, passionate about the trades and being a woman. I feel like if I had the, the proper guidance in high school and my guidance counselors, and again, no fault to them. It's just, it wasn't something that was really brought up. Um, I would have definitely gotten into the trades because I just feel like it's such a rewarding career to get into. It's a great way to make money. And, uh, you know, you're kind of just always, you get to put your creativity out there. So thankfully we have, um, our union is very forward thinking and we've actually have a partnership with Acon. So Acon is again, one of the largest construction companies in Canada. So they're huge. And we have a partnership with them. It's called the AWIT program. So it's ACON Women in the Trades. And the way it works is you would actually apply to ACON for the program. They would hire you as an apprentice. And then you would take your construction craft worker training with us with a um, emphasis on utilities because the women that are coming through the program will end up in their utility sector for ACON. So you will go through the program and while you're in the program, you'll be getting paid. So this is a great way to that we've come with our company and the training center is kind of meshed together. And now we have a program that we're kind of covering all the bases and it's, it has great wraparound supports for women, which is the great thing too. So, um, and women from all walks of life, we have single mothers, um, people that are getting into their second careers, women that have never been in construction before. So it's really nice to see how great they've kind of maneuvered in and said, taken that step to say, I want to be in out you know, in construction. So we've actually run, if I'm not mistaken, three classes now. And if you follow us on our social media, I'll put our handle in the chat. You can follow us there. We have a bunch of videos and also um, interviews with them and pictures of them working. So it's, it's really great to see that because I feel like it's a nice way to kind of mirror, oh, you know, like if she can do it, I can do it too. So that's, that's something really great that we're always kind of moving forward in, in that direction. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, what is local 183 training doing to engage more people from indigenous communities into the union, into your union? Yeah. So usually in all the kind of areas that we have a campus in, we try to network with the indigenous community in that area. Here in the GTA, we work with Ms. Way Beak. So they're actually, um, we, we do all their pre-apprenticeship program with us. They take their health and safety. We have a partnership with that and we take um, indigenous students that can come into our program and give them kind of like a head up on our program. So we have something catered specifically to them and that'll get them to work as quickly as possible. Also, um, Larry Villanueva, who is our director of indigenous affairs, he's actually working with a group out east um, in the Prince Edward County area. So we're really, we're gonna be catering a program and that will be hosted at our Cobra campus. 
and he's going to be catering a program in order to put a lot of the people um, in that area to work as well. So whether that'll be bridge building, because especially in that area, they're doing a lot of bridge revitalization. Prince Edward County, is, they're completely redoing that bridge as well. And in the past, we've also worked with Kajita Mikam, which is the group in that area as well. And the good thing is, so the last group that we did, we actually uh, purposely did a construction craft worker with an emphasis on bridge building, because that's where the, a lot of the money is going to be in that area. And a lot of the work will be in bridge building for that area as well. That's really exciting, man. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, what is Local 183 training doing to engage more newcomers into the union? Yeah. So just like all of our other programs, um, we are very inclusive in our, you know, what we offer, even so that we, because a lot of our membership are Portuguese or Hispanic. Um, so we actually do offer certain courses in Portuguese and also um, in Spanish. So they're able to kind of take that. Uh, we have an instructor that speaks it. All the actual testing and stuff is still in English because unfortunately we're not able to change that, but we have instructors that are able to help you with that. Um, and also, if we do get a newcomer that, let's say, their English isn't up to the standard for an apprenticeship, we will refer them to different third-party agencies that are able to help them get their English level to something that they're able to work in. And then we, we make sure that any type we go to different um, uh, career fairs, not catering specifically to newcomers in order to show them that this is a very viable option, a very great way to get into the union, especially because um, you get your benefits for people that are newcomers. That's a huge thing. It's like, you know, getting your glasses, teeth cleaning, doctor's appointments are very, very expensive. And no one wants to be paying that out of pocket, especially when you're a newcomer to Canada. So we're really trying to promote that into showing them that this is a great way to get into a very lucrative career. And, you know, you don't have to get into retail or whatever the case is. So uh, we're also trying to push it into that sector. This image that we're looking at, can you tell us what's happening here? Yeah, so this is actually our high rise Rodman class. So right now they're tying uh, rebar at the moment. So usually they there's two different types of training in this one. They're either tying it up on the wall or they're doing different uh, structures with it. Now, rebar is used to reinforce concrete. So they're put into concrete walls and they're formed, the concrete is porous, and then you have these uh, rods that are there to make sure that the concrete doesn't shift or move. So this is a great way of, um, again, this is a, also a great program. It's a fast construct. This is a construction skills program. It's called the High Rise Rodman. And I believe it's only four weeks in length. So it's really, and it's a very, very popular one as well. Okay, cool. Um, for newcomers who have language barriers who want to get into your union, what strategies can you offer them? Like I mentioned before, I would definitely um, maybe go to a third party agency. If I'm not mistaken, I'm trying, I can't think of one off the top of my head, um, but I know that there are agencies that are able to help uh, to kind of help with their English as a, like ESL, English as a second language. So to really help with that, or even just get a test just to see what your level is at. And then you can also come to, show that test to us and we'll let you know yes you know that'll help you or I think you still need a little bit more help with that so I would definitely get your English testing just to see what level you're at at least so you know okay awesome um what are two pieces pieces of advice can you give someone who's interested in getting into your union so they're listening to this session and they're like you know yeah I, I think I may want to so I would, first things first, I would visit our website. Um, we have a lot of information on there. There's a lot of great tools as well. Um, really get to know the type of program that you want to get into because I get a lot of calls, especially in students. And again, no fault to theirs. It's just, I feel like the way to maneuver into a union is very difficult and you kind of don't like, I can go this way or this way, like what's the best way? So I would visit our website. We have a lot of information on our programs. Try to figure out, maybe narrow down as to what type of program you want to get into. Do you want to get into, uh, you know, an apprenticeship? Do you have experience in construction and you're looking for more of an upgrade skill? So you want to do a construction skills program? Or do you just need health and safety because you're already working in the industry, but your, you know, your health and safety is expired? So the best way I always find to get into our union is by training. Because before it used to be a lot of, oh, well, if you, you know, my uncle's friend works at this site, we'll get you in. 
But now because safety is so it's at the forefront of every job that we do, a lot of companies are now starting to come to terms that, you know what, we can't just hire anyone because that's how accidents happen if they're not properly trained. And now there's a lot of incentives for apprentice, apprentices on your job site. So a lot of companies will get kickbacks if they have an apprentice on their job site. So they're actually looking for apprentices. Um, so I would definitely, a training, I always feel like it's the best way to get into it, especially if you've never worked in a construction industry, if you never worked in the industry before, this will be a great way to kind of get your feet wet and understand what it is that you want to really do. Because we have even have a lot of students that will come in and they'll say, oh, I'm going to become a towel setter for sure. They do their towel program. They're like, no way. Thank goodness I didn't get into that. So it's a great way to kind of like move around. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, what are three of the biggest changes you've seen um, in the construction sector over your career? Yeah, um, women, women in the trades is also is very, very big. Um, that's definitely something that, you know, before there, I feel like there was a big stigma with women that would get into construction. So now I feel like there's so much more empowerment. And even whenever I, you know, I'm part of, I attend orientations with um, our manager and I see women in the class, I get like so excited. I'm like, oh my God. And as much as, and I even tell them, I'm like, you know, I don't want to single you out. I hope that one day we can come to the day, is it, you know, to a day where women in, women in construction is just like, oh, not a big thing. Like, you know, we see them all the time. It's not, but now it's kind of just like, wow, you're in the program. That's so great. And I get so excited. And I, you know, I just always, I, I always talk to them and I always say like, how'd you get in here? What, what, what did you choose? Like, what was it? So then I can share with other people. Uh, so women in construction is a really big thing. I also feel like the amount of promotion in construction that's being done at schools is also quite, is has changed a lot. So whether it's Schism programs, the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program, now there's a, a big, a big shift into that. And I feel like a lot of schools and guidance counselors are starting to realize that the avenues for work for schooling is university, college, and trades. We're at, we're all at the same level. So they're starting to realize that, you know, trades is not down here. It's up here with the other with the other two choices. So it is a viable choice. I feel like a lot of teachers are starting to realize, you know what? Why are we going to take a fish out of water and tell him to swim when if we keep him in the water, he'll swim perfectly. So if you see a student that says that you could tell he's really good with his hands, why is your guidance counselor forcing you to go to school and not, you know, and sit in a classroom when he when he or she knows that that's not what they want to do. So we're, I feel like teachers are becoming more aware to cater their guidance into what's really acceptable for the students.